One question that troubled me when I lost my faith in Islam was the question of morality. Muslims take for granted that there are moral absolutes, unchanging standards of good and evil, taught to us by God. They say they provide us with the framework by which to live our lives as good and decent human beings. Without absolute moral standards, Muslims believe that man will become corrupt and sinful, drowning in a sea of moral relativism where anything goes. Now that I don't believe in Islam, I no longer believe that the morality it presents is divinely ordained. At first, this was quite a scary feeling. I felt I'd lost my yardstick for right and wrong, and I had a growing sense of moral confusion. In reality, I was still the same person that I had always been, and I behaved in the same way. But the thought that without strict moral boundaries I might be slowly corrupted frightened me. I thought about how the sheikhs and imams in the mosques had warned about the dire consequences of abandoning God's law, how they constantly cited examples of immorality in the decadent secular West as proof. Even in those days, I was always aware of the way they exaggerated the truth. I remember one sheikh saying that women walk naked in the streets and couples openly have sex in the parks. I was also aware of double standards. When some Muslims quoted criminal cases that were not typical of Western behaviour, such as paedophilia, rape or serial killings, as proof of the evil morality of the West, yet they protested with a great deal of righteous indignation if anyone dared to quote criminal cases that were not typical of Muslim behaviour, such as honour killings, wife beaters or terrorists. I also knew through my experiences with Muslim support groups that paedophiles, rapists and many other types of deviants did exist in Muslim societies but were usually brushed under the carpet by families under pressure to preserve their honour. But perhaps most crucially, the Qur'an itself presents very dubious standards of morality. Verses that sanction slavery, taking concubines, hitting wives or torturing unbelievers in the most savage manner for all eternity are the opposite of what I would call moral behaviour. I began to ask myself what exactly were these moral absolutes that Islam taught me. The more I looked, the more I realised that there was nothing that any human being, Muslim or not, wasn't aware of, and in fact it could be argued that in a few cases the morality Islam offered was a regression on models that already existed at the time. But if I no longer took my morality from Islam, where would I get it? How do I know what was right and wrong? Are there absolute standards? Or is everything relative? The more I thought about it, the more I realised that I did have a sense of what was right and wrong. I may not be able to define it fully, but I have always had an inner moral compass, and I still had it, despite my loss of faith in religion. In fact, it was my moral compass that led me to reject Islam. The fact that people may not always agree on what is right and wrong is no proof that we need religion to guide us. Muslims themselves, as well as those of other faiths, differ a great deal about what is right and wrong. And I'm not simply talking about minor issues, but some can't even agree on major issues. In fact, it could be argued, there is a greater sense of what is right and wrong in societies not ruled by religion than in those that are. Since they are not restricted by an outdated ancient text, but are able to apply the full weight of human reason that has not stood still for two millennia. It is no coincidence that only in recent times, when religion has been largely ignored, have we had such broad agreement on moral standards such as those set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which some Muslims still object to, arguing it contradicts Islamic law. The fact is that human beings are quite able to come up with moral values both collectively and individually, by using the powers of intellect, reason and conscience that we have all been given. We don't need an invisible man in the sky holding a big stick over us to make us moral beings. That in itself is immoral and sets a very low expectation of mankind that inevitably becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We know our actions have consequences here on this earth, both for ourselves and for others. 
the golden rule of treat others as you would wish to be treated is instinctive. The need for order in society necessitates it, as does reason and conscience. Of course, that does not mean that some human beings won't behave immorally, but what's new? Maybe it's easier and more comfortable to think that we have been given an external guide, a divine A to Z about what is right and wrong. But that seems to defeat the whole object of our existence as self-aware beings, to struggle with questions of right and wrong, good and evil. It is precisely why we have this ability. It's what makes us human.